There's a story about a woman from my hometown. She's coming back late from a trip and hits a gas station to fill up. She sees the intendant outside, and it's clear that he's closing down for the evening. She asks if he minds, and he tells her to go right on ahead. They make some small talk, and she just gets this weird feeling from him. He just seems really nervous to her, and she can't really figure out why. He offers to run a credit card inside for her, since this was a while back, and there was no credit card reader on the pumps. And being young and naive, she lets him. He comes back out a few minutes later, saying the card has been declined. She's shocked, and he assures her that the credit card company is on the phone. Initially, she refuses to come in, but he keeps insisting. She thinks she just can't take off and leave her credit card behind without paying for the gas. At least in the state of Maryland, you can lose your license for that. Eventually, she just caves and goes in to grab the phone. While her back is turned, he locks the door behind them. Ma'am, I don't mean to alarm you, but there's someone in your back seat with a knife. I've already called 911. I just wanted to get you in here before he realized I saw him. Understandably, she freaks out and assumes the attendant's just some crazy person who's lying to her. Until her peripheral vision catches somebody climbing out of the back passenger seat of her car, knife in hand. This legend can be tracked back as far as 1967 with some certainty. In 1982, it showed up in an Ann Landers column presented in the well-worn friend-of-a-friend format. In that same year, David Letterman also told the story on his show. In some versions that keep the gas station element, the attendant ends up marrying the woman he saved, and they live happily ever after. In some versions, the would-be attacker climbs into her backseat at the gas station. They're still caught, normally by the attendant, but every now and again in their patron. By far the most popular variant on this story is another motorist catching our would-be killer. They're driving behind her, see them in the back seat, and every single time it looks like they're going to strike, they either flash their high beams, honk their horn, ram the car. Once or twice I've even heard discussions of pit maneuvers. Eventually this motorist either runs her off the road or she's so freaked out she pulls over herself. That version tends to end with the other motorist warning her, but there are other times they'll just shoot the guy with no warning or explanation, and she pieces together what happened. And sometimes in this iteration, she's able to shake the other driver and makes it all the way home by herself. And in that moment, pieces together what the other motorist had been trying to do. This is also the only version where she saves herself. Sometimes the woman's driving along and stops because she sees a doll on the road. And this provides a distraction for the killer to climb into her back seat. This is a play on stories of people who stage car accidents and or lie on the road faking injuries in remote areas. When a good Samaritan stops to help, they're swarmed by their partners and robbed for their money and possibly car. One such occurrence involving two cars happened in Philadelphia in 2012 and in Raleigh, North Carolina in 2017. Articles about those will be linked in the description. In more light-hearted tellings of this story, the cops show up, guns drawn, only to find out the man in the back seat is her boyfriend. What he's holding is roses and an engagement ring. There is a supernatural narration that has a crazed person leaping out of nowhere and starts shouting gibberish and slamming their hands on the car. The woman runs from them, but no matter how far or what direction she drives, every time she stops, the same crazed person appears and attacks her car. She ends up running to a police station to tell them about this, the police calm her down and offer to drive her to her home or another safe place, but when they go with her to get her things from the car, they find the killer hiding behind the driver's seat. The crazed person was the ghost of one of the killer's victims trying to warn her. The firm details of this legend are, it's a lone woman driving, both the evildoer in the back seat and the savior are both male, and it takes place at night where it would be easier to conceal yourself hiding in somebody's back seat. At its core, it's a cautionary tale warning us to be vigilant of our surroundings, even in something as familiar as our own car. The big bad world is always lurking. And here comes the good old sexism. Let's start with the low-hanging fruit, female driver jokes. Moving on, she reasonably sees the attendant's behavior or the other motorist's driving as signs of aggression, when in reality they're the archetypal good guy. All the while, she's not realizing the real evil sitting literally in her backseat. Despite this basically being their modus operandi, 
This was created long before the term nice guy was sarcastically coined, but the parallels are hard to ignore. Why is she ignoring such a nice guy in front of her face when there's something truly evil in her car? You know, metaphors. She's also portrayed as the very definition of the helpless damsel in distress, a trope that pushes the idea that all women are victims and that most men left unchecked are victimizers. On a more positive note, it reiterates why you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, or in the case of the attendant, their job. While his odd behavior is because he's trying to help her, there tends to be an underlying tone of her looking down on him even before she clocks that. The segment in the film Urban Legend is a fantastic example of this. Even before hearing the attendant's speech impediment and dismissing him due to that, she's already being a bit rude. That's just her excuse to amp it up. This story is also a play on Americans' love of cars and personal space. On average, Americans prefer to be two to three feet away from acquaintances and strangers. Relatively speaking, this is larger than many other cultures. We also use cars in lieu of public transportation more often. While many areas have solid systems in place, urban sprawl and a myriad of other factors have left us behind other developed countries on that front. This is being noted because from a non-American's point of view, this can read as an odd preoccupation with cars and the space they create around us. We don't have a monopoly on car culture, but we certainly are the stereotype. Now the big question, is it real? Despite the legend's many incarnations and long history, real life instances are surprisingly and thankfully scarce. Part of this is this fits the tried and true urban legend format. Give enough detail so it's believable, but not enough that it's easy to track back. But as always, some elements do echo real life. There have been rapes where the attacker hid in the backseat. While rare, these occurrences sadly do happen and are being noted. As for carjacking, the vast majority of assailants open the door and get in the car while the driver's behind the wheel. For tactical reasons, there's very little lurking in the backseat. Surprising the driver while the car is in motion can lead to an accident. The attacker wouldn't be buckled up for obvious reasons, and even in the back seat, an unbuckled person in a car crash can cause serious injury if not death to themselves as well as the driver. It makes no sense for them to risk their life like that. The version where she drives home and finds the killer herself is one of the few versions that seems to take this idea into account. There is a source that claims that there is a headline dating back to 1935 in the Palo Alto time, with the headline, Man lurking in backseat, slugs girls, hurls victims to the ground, steals car and purses. While this claim does come from a credible news source, I couldn't backtrack this far enough in the publication's archives, hence the uncertainty of the statement. There is a case dating back to 1964, three years before the tentative starting point of this legend, that happened in New York. An escaped murderer hid in the backseat of a car. Ironically, this car belonged to a police detective who shot him. In 1990, in Bloomington, Indiana, a man hiding in a woman's van jumped out when he was spotted at a fast food drive through It's not specified who spotted him, but so far we have seen a recurring theme of involvement by bystanders and other drivers to the point where it's a crux of this urban legend. In 1991, in Newark, New Jersey, a man was hiding in the back seat of a woman's Jeep who slashed the victim's cheek. There's no clarification on if cutting her was his goal or if he was back there looking to do something else. In regards to pop culture representation, I normally like to talk about those before the analysis, but since this trope is so saturated into pop culture, even limiting references to only humanoid beings who are hiding in the backseat with murderous intent, it still yields at least 44 different results. Having me list and explain all those would be painfully boring for everyone involved. So on video platforms, I'm going to run a chronological montage of poster art for these titles. On audio-only platforms, these movies will be listed under the Works Discussed section. Sans this first title because it's going to need a little bit of discussion. An episode of The Twilight Zone from 1960 titled The Hitchhiker adds some ambiguity about this legend's start date, since it aired seven years prior. 
The reason people are a little leery to consider this the official start to the urban legend, it's essentially a cross between the supernatural variant of this story and the other urban legend, The Vanishing Hitchhiker. The episode revolves around a mysterious hitchhiker who doesn't appear in the car's back seat until the very end of the episode. But the panic he causes, the lone woman, and the fear and confusion is in line with our killer in the back seat. We even get a gas station at one point. The catch is the man she thinks is threatening her is actually trying to tell her that she died at the beginning of the episode, giving it that splash of vanishing hitchhiker. And yes, this was also a pretty clear influence on the 1962 film Carnival of Souls. Thank you for listening. I would like to take a moment out to thank my patrons. Gani, Scotty Robot, Carla Hoffman. Their financial contributions are deeply appreciated, and so is everyone's time and viewership. Thank you. Now for your montage. <laughs>